Truly California is a KQED production presented in association with the Bay Area Video Coalition and Film Arts Foundation. Next on Truly California. The Salton Sea was once known as the California Riviera. In the 50s and 60s, the sea had more tourists than Yosemite Park. After a string of disasters, the desert lake is now considered an environmental train wreck. Wall to wall, dead fish, 150 feet out from my dock. A surreal paradise on the verge of collapse. Next on Plagues and Pleasures on the Salton Sea. Support for Truly California is provided by the Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund. Individuals, foundations, and corporations committed to the production and acquisition of quality programs. And by Ambassador James C. Hormel and Timothy C. Wu, and the Wallace Alexander Gerbodi Foundation, and the members of KQED. Let me tell you about a place far beyond the sprawl of suburban America, where success and failure collide, and where utopia and the apocalypse meet to dance a dirty tango. It's a special place, a bit closer than you might think, that draws a unique group of outsiders looking for an awfully beautiful life on the edge of a beautifully awful paradise. Uh, you know what, there's very few people that uh, know about the Salton Sea. Very few. If they don't know where it's at, you tell them 50 miles south of Palm Springs. Which I use as a reference point. California's version of the French Riviera, with uh, beautiful weather, water available for boating, and as a place for recreation and fishing and so on. Fishing in the summer is great. Great. The hotter the water, the better the fishing. That's not edible fish. If they're eating those fish and they eat very much of them, they'll get botulism poisoning. That sea is filthy. Dead fish, dead birds, dead everything over there. We have the odor problem, we have the insect problem, namely the common house fly. It gets hot here in the summer. It's 120 degrees here. 100 degrees at midnight, you know it's warm. But that's what we got air conditioning for. We do even go swimming in the water. It's more saltier than the ocean. And it's, uh, it, it heals your skin. If you have a skin problem, it heals your skin. Why clean up a most useful sewer? It's the greatest sewer the world has ever seen. Leave it that way. It's perfect for that purpose. If it had been handled correctly, it'd been, it would have been another Palm Springs right now. Smell. It's the smell that a lot. And then the fact that we don't have anything here. It is rather bleak. Bleak is the word. The most beautiful body of water in California. You can go boating, you can go fishing, you can go jet skiing. You have beautiful rock formation. You have the mountains where you can see on a, on a summertime, you can see the snow caps in the mountain. You have everything. You have everything that you can find nowhere else. There's no fast foods here. There's no, uh, no recreation for youngsters, kids or anything. I mean, it ain't nothing here. You can't get nothing. The store's closed at 6 o'clock. So you can't buy booze after another 6 o'clock. I like it here. I'll yeah. die here. I mean, come on. We ain't even got a mall or nothing out here. We're away from everything. But it's it's just a super, super wonderful place. Yeah.
well below sea level, in one of the hottest and driest valleys on Earth, sits the wonderfully bizarre Salton Sea. It was once hailed as the fishing capital of the world and even rivaled the nearby resort town of Palm Springs in popularity. But now, after a string of catastrophes, it sits virtually abandoned and forgotten. Only a handful of eccentrics remain, carving out their own slice of paradise on the shores of the so-called ecological disaster. But disaster is well known to the people of Imperial Valley. In fact, the Salton Sea itself is just one big mistake. In 1901, developers with a dream to transform the desert diverted water from the Colorado River to a dried lake bed named the Salton Sink. As an ancient overflow for the Colorado River, the soil was nutrient rich and the warm climate made it possible to grow crops year round. Renamed the Imperial Valley, land was sold and farming flourished in the desert. However, silt eventually blocked the entrance to the canal and water delivery was all but cut off to the farmers. Under pressure from desperate investors, engineers made several unprotected cuts into the river. Then in 1905, Amidst heavy spring rains, the erratic Colorado broke free, changed course, and headed straight for the Imperial Valley. The river that had once brought prosperity now began to destroy everything in its path as it began to collect in the lowest point, the Salton Sink. In order to protect a vital shipping route, Southern Pacific Railroad tycoon Edward Harriman intervened with the support of President Theodore Roosevelt to do battle with the river. With thousands of men and countless tons of rock and sand, the railroad and the United States government attempted several times to plug the breach. After tremendous effort and 16 months of flooding, they finally managed to turn back the river. The desert heat should have quickly evaporated this man-made mistake. However, salty irrigation runoff from farmers in the Imperial Valley sustained the newly formed sea and increased its salinity to near ocean levels. An engineering screw-up had given birth to a sea 35 miles long and 15 miles wide in the middle of the desert. Salton Sea would be good, good for fish if they could get the right kind of fish to grow in there. So they went down to San Felipe and seen fish out of the surf there. But uh, they tried to keep all the sharks out. They didn't want to put any sharks in here. And they brought the fish up. I met them at Salt Creek up here. They put the fish in right there at Salt Creek, uh, 1951 in June. Finally, in 1957, we started catching a few corvina at Salt Creek. We caught the first two limits of fish that were ever caught in the Salton Sea. We caught 12 fish there, average between eight and 10 pounds. And that started the fishing down here. By 1960, there were eight boat landings around the sea, launching 50 to 100 boats a day. They were here by the hundreds, up and down this highway, and we, we fed uh, 100 fishermen a day here during the summertime, you know. If you like to fish, there are plenty in the Salton Sea. So far, they've been caught up to 33 pounds. There are corvina, tortuava, and mullet in abundance. It's not anything like it used to be. It used to be beautiful. There used to just be trailers and, and motorhomes and skiers and boaters and swimmers everywhere. In the 60s, particularly was really a vibrant sea. Um, you not only had skiing, swimming and such, you had the rich folks coming down LA with the sport fishing boats, putting in, I guess, probably North Shore and doing the sport fishing on the weekends, and uh, all kinds of nice, nice little 
you know, secluded places for those that wanted to get away from the crowd. Uh, swimming and uh, <laughs> drinking beer. <laughs> drinking beer and throwing skimming rocks. The water was brackish then. It wasn't, uh, it isn't like today. It was, it was, it was uh, less salty than the ocean at that time. And we used to have fish fries. So anybody that caught any brought them up and the Corvina and oh God, they were so good. And they, they cooked them in a beer batter. Fun, fun, fun. Water means fun and salt and sea water is ideal for the amateur skier, superb for the skillful. The reason? The low altitude and the accompanying density make salt and sea one of the fastest bodies of water on Earth. In the 50s and 60s, the sea took in more, had more tourists than Yosemite Park. Down here, we had boat races. We had everything. We had um, all kinds of celebrities at the Salton Sea and big events. And we had Sonny Bono and the Marx Brothers and the Beach Boys used to come out here. The yacht clubs on all sides were developing and booming and boats were in and out of the water. Eventually, this area was laid out as a retirement community. They basically laid this out, put in the infrastructure, and then started selling it. Out of the labor and mind of man, out of the barren desert, out of the many months of endeavor and daring imagination, a city is born. And business sees a future in Salton City and becomes part of the great scheme of things. A major oil company becomes a part, a modern restaurant. People came on buses, busloads of people, to spend the day and buy the lots. Free little tours of the place and the little bus, they had little buses and golf carts. Gave them a little spiel on the bus and then took them to the yacht club and had a marina there and had a nice lunch at the, at the yacht club. The yacht club was a beautiful place had good food, uh, had uh, most of the time a very competent bartender. He knew how to make drinks instead of just splashing them in, you know. Yeah, a couple of good drinks, good company, do some dancing. What does man seek? Whatever it is, it's here at Salton City. Here is all that you and your family, your children and your children's children will want in sports, in relaxation, in pleasure, in health, in security. Yes, an investment in a growing, prosperous future. This is the birth of a city, an investment in the future. The future is now. And you, you have been present at the birth of a city. Rising Sea came primarily from accusations of excessive agricultural runoffs to the south. When the farmers ordered water, they would order enough to be sure they had enough. And they'd close their gates to their farm when they had all they wanted, let the rest run out, and it came into the sea. Well, there's conflicting stories about how it happened whether it was deliberate or not deliberate or what. What happened, I don't know, but the water rose. And we were smacked by a pair of tropical storms, one in 76, one in 77, that dropped unbelievable amounts of rainwater on the Imperial Valley. Really flooded the sea. So we, had, we started sandbagging, and that wasn't doing much good either. We'd be out, it might be midnight. Crews of us would be out here sandbagging because water was coming over. We had a friend that lived below 4th Street in a mobile home, and the water was coming in her front door. So she brought her dog and her cigarettes and her bottle of booze and came up, and we, we sweated out. Nobody got mad or scared and ran away or anything. BLM told us to evacuate. We said, huh, <laughs> too many years. 
it tore up the uh, marina by the yacht club. Just washed it out to sea, practically. We picked up pieces of it, and when something major like that went out, they weren't about to replace it. It uh, was the last vestige of, of the good times down here. As an unnatural body of water, the sea is like a giant puddle at the bottom of a drained swimming pool. With no outlet, the water level can change suddenly, and anything the water brings in stays there. The only reason this puddle doesn't dry up is because of salty irrigation runoff from surrounding farms. But with six feet of evaporation a year, this life-sustaining runoff is concentrated into a salty soup. Let's just say it's not the best situation for the fish. Wall to wall, dead fish, 150 feet out from my dock and about a quarter of a mile long. During the summer, the water in the salt sea is so warm and so salty that oxygen will have a difficult time dissolving. So we have these large die-offs of tilapia, which is for the simple reason that there's no oxygen for them to breathe. Goodbye, fish. <laughs> and they'll die by the millions. The decay does get pretty smelly at times. When they die, they are fertilizer. They are nutrients returned to the sea water and the nutrients are so high, they create algae blooms. Continuous cycle of fish dying, providing nutrition for more algae, which means more fish. Now, it is, there are just too many fish here. That the Salton Sea has about 100 million tilapia in it, which is a huge population. Some people think that it's the most productive tilapia resource, maybe even in the world. The population of the fish in here is, uh, is stupendous, because you know what? The, the, the quantity of the fish, you see them dying all over the place, and yet you don't lose none. They're right back again the next year. The, there's thousands and thousands of them. And you see them sometimes stacked two and three feet high on the beach where they have a die off. But you go out fishing uh, when, this, when the season hits and everything, and it's full of fish. Yeah, so what, 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 what can I say? By 1980, most people had given up any explosive growth. The building was limited by the demand, which there wasn't a great deal of. And seeing what real estate values were starting to do then, you, know, you can't lose. Well, you can't win either. <laughs> Salton City, unfortunately, was developed as a, a place to make money by buying a lot. With the water and everything, this would become a resort area like the Mediterranean. And years ago, it had sort of a chance, but the, the, if it had been built rather than uh, sold lots. The problem was, of course, that they sold it to people who were greedy and wanted to make money on it rather than as a place to live. This is the last frontier. It's the last place you can go and get cheap land. And I mean cheap. Any of all these little teeny squares in here are lots. There are 26,000 lots in this subdivision. And every lot has some um, uh, sewer, it's on the sewer, like city sewerage. City sewer, have water in the street, and you pay for a water meter to hook up. If you're building or put a mobile home on it, it has to be a double wide mobile home. And um, 
It's a fantastic deal. You can buy one for $3,500 cash. You don't have to be rich to own a piece of California. See the land there. You can own a piece of Southern California for as little as $100 down and monthly payments less than what you would spend on your electric bill. You don't have to be rich. The landman has the answer. When, when, when I first came here and I saw this opportunity, first I saw the view. I said, wow, there it is. Unique, this thing. It's the next thing that came to my mind, dollars, dollars, dollars. Man, I'm going to come here and make, make a fortune. Hasta mi bebita sabe un buen negocio cuando lo ve. See the land, man. You know, people in the land business, they talk about the salt and the sea. It's a legend. It's a, it's a, it's a legend of failure, of things, horrible things that happen. And I came here, and I saw everything. I saw the view. I saw the sea. I saw everything that was happening. And I saw a tremendous opportunity to change people's perception of the sea. Even if you don't want to build it right now, it's going to accelerate in value. It has to. And when it happens, I don't know, but it will happen. You have a lot of people that are waiting for things to happen, and they all feel like it's just around the corner. And they've probably been feeling like it's just around the corner for 10 or 15 years. I've always thought the sea would grow, it would do something. It's taken longer than I thought, but in the meantime, if property comes up for sale and the price is right, I buy it. Uh, I haven't overpaid for any of it, but it's, it's an investment. People are buying and, and like to speculate, you know, if they play the lottery, they should at least get a $400 lot out here someplace. <laughs> but there's still a lot of lots out here for sale. The material is here. It'll take a lot of work. But I think it'll be worth it in the end. I'm just sorry that I won't be here to see it, probably. And my life expectancy is, I guess, around 11 years, something like that. And uh, I don't expect to see miracles in that time. While many continue to wait for the dream, across the sea in the working class haven of Bombay Beach, people have already found paradise. But half flooded, with no gas station, one tiny store, two delightful bars, and an obsession with golf carts, this dusty little town isn't everyone's idea of what the dream was supposed to become. This whole area down here below the dike was flooded out. Right over there, that what's left of building is what used to be the luck of the Irish. And over there where it's fenced, there used to be a beer bar called Waterfront and a fishing pier. But it's all gone. The old people, uh, they stay in their house during the daytime and they come out at night. Most of them do anyway. A guy shot himself in the head right there. There's one down the street where a guy hung himself. And this one on the corner right there, he died trying to take a poop right there in his house. A couple of strokes and old age things, brain tumor and artery bypass, you know. Just in my house, a person died over there. And this one, too, my best friends died this over there, you know. A lot of people have died out here. I don't know if it's from old age or, uh, you know, because of of, uh, you know, the conditions or what. I had a little problem when we were working at Desert Hospital, a little cancer problem. And I said, that's it, I'm not working anymore. You know, who knows, maybe tomorrow, maybe then. And that's been 20 years ago. So I blame my good health on the salt and sea. <laughs> We have lots of yard sales. 
that lady's husband died and she's moving, so. Then we worry about things like this because of the kids. They get in and smoke the grass and, you know, some of the black kids are just delightful. But there's a, a group that are in trouble. Look at that ridiculous windmill house. <laughs> coming from L.A. that uh, that caused a lot of problems, robbing houses and, uh, uh, you know, selling drugs and stuff like that. There's more welfare people here now. It's cheaper, rent's cheaper here, so county sends them out here. When the, when the young kids come in here, they don't do nothing but raise hell. I thought we were going to call a cop on you. What's a cop going to do? <laughs> Maybe you bring me on a lollipop? Yeah! <laughs> they can't do nothing. Uh -uh. And their parents, they don't teach them nothing. I don't know. I lived out here so long to where I'm just kind of used to it. It's boring out here, but it's cool. It's away from the city. You ain't got to worry about gang banging. You ain't got to worry about none of that stuff out here. Only one problem we have is they need to clean up that out there so everybody, you know, have something to do besides fishing. You know, don't nobody want to eat that stuff out of there. It, you know, and you know, out here it ain't, I don't know, see all these kids out here? We need something for the kids. As you can see, we only got one little park, and that, that's really about it. My mom, my biological mom, got shot and killed by her boyfriend. And my mom's sister took care of us. And El Centro was too rough, too rough for us, so she moved us out here. When she moved us out here, you know, hey, things happen. I got pregnant, and I choose to raise my son out here. I'm not going to take him to El Centro and raise him. I'm going to raise him right here on Bombay Beach. There ain't nothing out here, no violence, none of that. You know what I'm saying? It's a retiring place it's for old people. If you raise them up in the city, they'll either be gang banging, shooting each other. I mean, hatred. I mean, that's if you raise them up in the city. But if you raise them up in Bombay Beach, your kids won't be growing up like that. In the city, he'll get shot and killed in less than 48 hours. Up here, he have a better chance of living. Go, go, go. Everybody gets weed around here. But when they ask me for some or Flaubert or anybody, they say no. Because we know our respects. We know. Bombay Beach treat me good. They got all the 40s and all the weed. God died for our sins. So I'm not going to pull God like that and just keep on doing stuff, like drugs and stuff. I ain't going to do that. I ain't doing that. Anybody ask me for drugs, man. No. Heck no. I ain't with that dope boy. <laughs> How about Pumpkins. soccer, you guys? So soccer? soccer? Oh, yeah, that's my sport. sport. That's, that's my sport. sport. That's basketball. Boom, 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 bass. <laughs> yeah. Just oh, all that stuff. <laughs> Volleyball. <laughs> Forgotten and flooded, Bombay Beach is the perfect refuge from the outside world. But when you live in a trailer park on the edge of an ecological time bomb, you got to have some fun and drink plenty of beer. Everybody, this Watch is Honky Daddy. Daddy. This is Honky Daddy, our favorite guy in the town. This is my guy. Yeah, uh, honky Daddy, that's what I call him. And this is your other dog. I Let me go get some beer. This is, is a baby oh, boy. That over there is a girl. She, she has babies. And she is pretty, too. I like her. They are very friendly. That one right Everybody have fun. Mom for the road, mom for you too. Come on, so what? Here, that's what I got. Ooh. Here, Sorry. don't hurt you, sir. Les, he's uh, one of a kind, that's for sure. Hey, girl, watch that. Woo! <laughs> that's embarrassing. <laughs> okay, take care, take care, you too. Mom, <laughs> daddy, my that's my, my guy baby. right here. Yeah. Woo! He's, uh, What can I say about him? He's nuts. <laughs> he's he's uh, wild. Howdy, boy. He's a wild child. Oh, daddy. 
He loves women, all women. I don't care what they are, black, white, yellow, green. <laughs> he loves them all. Hey, baby. There's a lot of Hungarians in Bombay. They, they seem to like the, well, all Hungarians like to party, I must say. And some people call them Hungarian, but you pay attention to the language, and I bet you they speak in Russian. You know, my dad moved there, and then Zoli Bachi moved there, and Louis moved there, and Yoshka Joe, he moved there. They're all dead. All of them died. And then there was Les and Seagon and... Yeah, there's a bunch of them. There's one there, there's one there. There was one over across the street there. There are kids like me, Lanka and Aniko, and... God, there's a lot of Hungarians, <laughs> I'm telling you. Hungary are revolution to which we sort of fight for or 1956. Almost with bare hands, patriots joined by the Hungarian army rose spontaneously and made a shambles of the mighty Russian tanks. For 10 days, they sent the red might reeling. I just get up to uh, army, hunky army. I have to show the kids there, which we have to use the gun and a hand granite, everything. I just get up to army, see? But retribution was swift and crushing. 20 new divisions of tanks moved in. This time, shaken Kremlin leaders took no chances, and rebellion turned to slaughter in the unequal struggle. Did you have to escape Hungary then in 56? Oh, God, I have to. I have to. Otherwise, I'd never be here. I freed the country. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm proud of. It. Oh, f yeah. I got, I, I got all over my body the, uh, uh, the low hoochie, the snuffs, uh, all over my body, hand granite coming into my ear. My ass all over the f***ing low things. Oh, it hurts. Yeah, he was a freedom fighter. Because I never saw any pictures of him in uniform. You know, I know he was in the war, but I never saw any pictures of him in uniform. So I guess that he saved people's lives underground or whatever. And then he came to America, and he loved this desolate desert. Beautiful. I love this country more than American people. I tell them, you don't believe it. I got everything where I want. I do anything what I want. Beautiful life I have. Special deck corner here. It's a magic corner here. Always beautiful Sunday, sunshine, beautiful life. That's America, see? business around the valley here. All the, all the boat landings were closed because there wasn't any business. You know what, if they, if they do the salt and sea, everything will be so much better. I and mean, property taxes will go up. And there's just, look at, we're out in the middle of this desert where it gets 120 with this huge body of water that we can't even use. It's absolutely ridiculous. It makes me sick. Everything's built up in big cities now. And it has to go somewhere. It has to come this way. Where else can they go? This will this will be a winter resort down here before too many years, I think. It used to be a nice little town, but now they they're trying to make something out of it, but they never will. And you can't take nothing and make anything out of nothing. Once a station for thousands of vacationing fishermen coming to the Salton Sea, Nylon now barely hangs on. Its only salvation lies in the construction of a very different kind of tourist attraction. Leonard Knight came here about 10 years ago and started building that mountain. He's been working on it ever since, every day. He comes in here every morning early, stays an hour or so, and has coffee with us. And he's a good, a good man. He's a religious, but he doesn't push it on you. You can be as religious as you want, as long as you don't try to push him into your religion. <laughs> I just believe that God really built this mountain. I didn't. I'm not really capable of, especially being an artist, and I'm just not capable of doing anything, but God Almighty can do anything. And if I've talked to God a lot, and I, I keep a saying almost every morning, God, use me if you can. I want to work for you, God. 
and look at the mountains going better than 10 churches all uh, put together sometimes. You know, when it comes to paint, I just love paint. Old paint, new paint, pretty paint, and I like latex at first. If I get a pretty color, oil, high gloss paint, I keep it for the flowers. So no matter what comes in, I'm excited about it. <laughs> people just bring me their paint. And I like to give postcards to people, so it's a give me mount. I have no education from man whatsoever, so if there's any part of this mountain, it's not, I didn't read it in a book, or I didn't push a, a internet push button. And now people, uh, people really think I'm an artist. I hope I'm not a counterfeit. <laughs> Yeah, I've learned by mistakes, man. You make a mistake and you kind of have fun doing it, but then you look back and say, hey, there must be a better way. I made one mistake that took me four years and the whole mountain fell off. So I don't want to make mistakes that big anymore. At first, I didn't build it right. And uh, I, I went to the dump and then I'd get a refrigerator, truck tires, and I'd fill them with sand and put them in here and put some cement with it. And in 1991, the whole mountain fell down. Uh, I probably had two or 300 tons of adobe up here. And uh, it was about that time I looked up and uh, I says, God, you build the mountain. Just don't let Leonard build it. God, you do it. And uh, boy, ever since then, I just started digging in this mountain and I've been totally happy ever since. The Salton Sea needs uh, tourism and money. We need people to come in and, and fill up the restaurants and put their waitresses to work. And I hope that in years to come, this thing will turn into a tourist attraction and bring millions and millions of dollars into California. The Salton Sea Refuge in particular was set up as a waterfowl wintering area. That was our main goal, but things have changed a lot. On Monday, biologists discovered 58 dead birds at the Salton Sea and rescued 10 Mysterious brown outbreak pelicans. outbreak of avian botulism, a deadly illness from bacteria usually found in maggots. Water temperatures remain high. Everything is ideal for botulism, and it usually does its thing. In the past three weeks, experts and volunteers have been rescuing as many birds as possible, including the rare California brown pelican. I guess I could best describe 96. You had birds. Uh, getting sick and dying literally by the hundreds on a daily basis. That might have been an indication that the sea was not doing well, that there was ecologically a problem. The number of dead birds built up to the point where at that time we only had the one incinerator, which is a smaller one. It could not even begin to take care of the problem. It ran 24 hours a day nonstop. It's depressing. It's very depressing. Uh, mainly because you know that there's nothing that you can do other than try to clean the mess up to make it stop. When you have really hot days with a very high salinity level, it's set the table for botulism to go crazy. The tilapia pick up botulism and carry it in their body. The fish become toxic to the pelicans and they get botulism and die. Botulism uh, spreads through contamination of other birds. When a dead bird that has botulism begins to decompose, of course, it fills up with maggots. The maggots pick up the botulism toxin and it does not affect them. So each maggot that crawls around presents the possibility of another dead or sick bird. It spreads quite fast if you don't do anything to take care of the problem. Uh, cleaning up the areas is one of the most important things that you can do. Year-round, we'll go out once a week or so and cover one particular area of the sea or another. Uh, and once we start picking up pelicans, usually out of the south end here, around uh, the Alamo River or the New River, then uh, we'll step up patrols to uh, eventually to uh, seven days a week. 
So we'll go out there, we'll pick up the birds off of the shore that are dead. Uh, we'll also pick up as many live birds as we can, treating them on site at our uh, rehab hospital. It was kind of difficult at first picking up all those pelicans and you know knowing that they're sick and uh, possibly could die, but uh, now knowing that seven out of every ten are going to make it, you know, kind of gives you a good feeling. There is just a, a tremendous amount of birds that come through this area, simply because of its geographic location, plus the, the mild winters. And you also have to remember that most of the California's wetlands have been lost for one reason or another, and this is one of the few remaining wetlands there are. We still have disease problems in the summertime. Uh, we have had every summer since 96, and it's, it's again, probably not gonna go away. But because of uh, our experience and uh, the infrastructure that we now have, these problems aren't really bad. Uh, we, we are able to keep up with it and actually stay ahead of the game. There are a number of plans to address the problems with the Salton Sea, and there are dozens and dozens of plans to address the problems with the Salton Sea, and perhaps that's a problem in itself. In my mind, it's a canal, or it's a, it's a pipeline, a water movement. Take water out, put water back in. There are other approaches to look at ponding portions of the Salton Sea to draw the salt out, to use enhanced evaporative systems currently used in Israel. It's an age-old problem, because it's been going on for 30 years. Um, but it's come to the point where I really don't think that we have another 30 years. We need to solve it now. Scientists knew how to save the sea, but they lacked the attention and funds to make it happen. What they needed was a hero. What they got was a rock star. Well, I love, where would you be now? Now, now, now. Sonny Bono, musician, restaurateur, Palm Springs mayor and ex-husband of Cher was elected to Congress, and the Salton Sea found its champion. I may have to wear that, uh, that Sonny and Cher thing for a while, but I'll overcome that. I just need to talk to people, and I'll, I'll overcome that. Sonny Bonham uh, was able to develop and generate a lot of interest in the Salton Sea with his peers in Congress, and I think he's the one that really brought attention to the problems of the Salton Sea, to Congress, to the federal government. It's the first time I've seen this kind of energy go into a project that is dearly needed to prevent a, an environmental disaster. Sonny was a reborn environmentalist. He did have quite an interest in wildlife and wanted to see something done. You could not only um, avoid this, this disaster, but you could all, also create a, a recreational mecca. I think Sonny was good for the sea. Unfortunately, he went skiing. He had introduced some legislation into Congress just before he died. And uh, unfortunately, I mean, that's a terrible way to have to get something passed, is to have somebody get killed in an accident. But I think that was probably the, the spark that got Congress to go ahead and, and come forward with some funding. As Sonny said, the beat goes on, and uh, all of his friends have uh, friends in Congress have picked up uh, the ball that he was carrying, and uh, I think we'll take it across the goal line. References were made all day to keeping Sonny Bono's legacy alive, as federal, state, and local leaders discussed ways to save the ailing sea. This is a great natural resource to be managed and nurtured and reclaimed, and we will be introducing, uh, with Mary's permission, on Sonny's birthday, uh, the Sonny Bono Salton Sea Restoration Project. We want to keep the area for the things like Sonny Bono wanted, like, you know, boating and fishing and water skiing. And we want to help economic development, the sports fishery. And then the final one is we want to help the migratory bird habitat. We have a lot of groups that are working with us that are interested in saving the sea. We have all the way from irrigators and developers and cities all the way to environmentalists. So we've got a nice group of a lot of people. 
And that's nice. That's fun to do that because maybe we can all come up with an answer. That's what we hope. That's what we hope. With the creation of the Salton Sea Restoration Act in 1998, the people around the sea were all dolled up and ready for the pool party to begin. But with the passing years and continued delays, their visions of a happy, bright future had begun to fade. It now seems even the Bono boom has gone bust. Everyone was going to save the salt and sea. When the hype ended, Sony's Berry, a park was, a reserve was, was named after him. Half a freeway somewhere. All those people left. We're back to square one, basically. Just a little more impulse, but we're basically back to the same problem. We all felt like once the Salt Sea Authority was created, this would be the best, probably final effort. And they've done a beautiful job. I don't knock the Salt Sea Authority at all. They've just been given their criteria and their parameters and been told what to do by Congress. And then you've got the political pressure against it. Whatever they try to do, it's just up a one-way street. What do you call that the, the, the Sonny Bono wife work on it that the projects around here to come uh, coming up a couple hundred millions to clean up this fucking yard? <laughs> but the fucking money I never got here. So that they can clean the fucking place. You know, it's shame for America to the special California have a big lake in the USA. I let them go like that. You know, it's shame. America have a billion, million dollars that doesn't put no money on this country to clean it, you know. Pollution water to get it in. Kill them. Body mine. Drunk. I think you better change, otherwise there ain't gonna be no future. At least not here. This place here is going. The water's receding rather rapidly. Last year, those rocks right there were underwater. The fishing is not what it used to be. The partying is not what it used to be. And people are, uh, you know what? They sell out and get, and get out. They don't come back, which is down near a ghost town. There are many people who, like me, can't afford to move in the sense that what I could get out of this house wouldn't buy anything anyplace else. Right. So people have settled in, and uh, a lot of them uh, have come here to die. The water that comes into the Salton Sea in great part comes from agriculture. So this water comes from the Colorado River, is used on our crops and eventually finds its way into the Salton Sea. And that water is attractive. Many people are saying, well, let's recycle that water that goes into the Salton Sea and use it for some, something else. Uh, some people in the water districts have flat out said in the local newspapers, say it's a waste of water to let it flow into the Salton Sea. San Diego and the Imperial Valley are working on a water transfer agreement. If approved, San Diego County would buy Colorado River water from the Imperial Irrigation District. The county will receive up to 200,000 acre feet of water every year for at least the next 40 years. We're in the best possible position in terms of this being a good deal for San Diego, not only today, but 10 and 20 and 30 years from now. I'm, I'm getting cynical and I'm getting vocal. And I'm telling people, they're stealing it. Like, wake up, wake up. They have absolutely cut off every source of water that will maintain us. We're down to annual rainfall. It is an ideal, perfect sewer. Put it in that perspective, use it that way, <clears throat> then the whole world is happy. 
go in there, kill all the crummy fish off, tell people to quit swimming in it. If you kill all the fish off, the birds will go away. Well, then the birds aren't dying anymore, so the bird lovers are happy. Birds, they'll just go someplace else. <laughs> the problem is, is that we have, in Southern California, consumed 90% of our wetlands in the time that the Salton Sea has existed. So the Salton Sea has come to be a replacement for the wetlands for these birds. So now, as the sea becomes saltier, and the fish will no longer be able to survive, the fish-eating birds that come here, well, they'll have to go somewhere else. The question is, where are they gonna go? I mean, they, they can't go to LA, because we're there. They can't go to Orange County, because we're there. San Diego, we're there. Colorado River, we're there. People say, why should we care if the salt and sea is saved? And I said, well, you're really gonna care when about seven miles of the north end is exposed and there's a lot of dry bottom there and you get a doggone alkali dust storm come down and shut the whole valley down in a cloud of alkaline dust. We warned them and stuff, uh, no one cares. The storms that race through, run through here, we've had as high as 75 mile an hour winds look noted here, uh, raise dust like they do up in the Owens Lake north of Los Angeles, which the Metropolitan District of Los Angeles created by their bankrupting the Owens Lake for water. The same will happen to the sea if it dries up. San Diego gonna give us $9 million to mitigation to fix all that? Now this people, this people that have the nice homes and, and, and Indian wells and Palm Spring and we have beautiful golf courses in Palm Spring. You don't hear anybody saying, let's put some of the water on the Palm Spring golf courses into the Salt Sea. You probably have a rebellion. I think what's important for people to understand, that smell that you do smell occasionally from the Salt Sea, as it gets worse, that smell will get worse too. Palm Springs will have nothing but that smell where some of the richest people in the United States live. Well, they keep their multi-million dollar winter house and go golfing with green fees or hundreds of dollars every day. Nothing is gonna happen in Salt Sea until people realize they're gonna make money or it's gonna hurt them in their pocketbooks. Folks up north of us haven't realized that Palm Springs won't be Palm Springs if the Salt Sea fails. for 27 years. It's a good place, yeah. We've done a lot of business here. But we're we're getting ready to sell it. I think we're, uh, I'm just about getting too old to run a restaurant. I did a lot of fishing, a lot of hunting on the Salt Sea. It's been a, been a wonderful recreation area, and it, we hope it will be that way again. have been coming here for 20 years just to come in and have a co cup of coffee in the morning even if it's for five minutes and leave they've been doing it for 20 years and so it's going to be a change for him like Leonard he comes in he fills up my ice thing before I even get there and he's gone before the place even opens up they've been good friends and good company and uh, I'm gonna miss them well I'm glad they're closing and they can't close soon enough because I've gotten used to them not being there already. They're the highest priced place in town. I said you're gonna take the tape off and burn it. No, I said <laughs> take the tape off. Do your thing. No, shut up. <laughs> so I can take the tape off. I said I'm done. He's gonna miss it. He, he loves it. I mean, obviously you're 91 years old and you're still working four days a week. You have to like it a little, you know? It's kind of sad because it's been here for so long, but at least I'll get a day off. <laughs> no, I, it, it's sad because, uh, I don't know.
know, it's, it's, it's part of Nyland, you know? I, Harold in this cafe is just part of Nyland. Want more of Truly California? Visit our website to watch previews of upcoming episodes, listen to interviews with filmmakers, watch short documentaries, and sign up for our newsletter. It's all at kqed.org slash trulyca. Support for Truly California is provided by the Campaign for the Future Program Venture Fund. Individuals, foundations, and corporations committed to the production and acquisition of quality programs. And by Ambassador James C. Hormel and Timothy C. Wu, and the Wallace Alexander Gerbodi Foundation, and the members of KQED. Truly California is a KQED production presented in association with the Bay Area Video Coalition and Film Arts Foundation.